Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, good night to everyone who's uh, joining online. I think the uh, session's going to start again. I'll give you a, a minute to get back to your seats. So I would like to thank everyone for uh, coming today and especially to the CRCG for organizing this workshop. I think it's a very important topic as, as Anna laid out this morning. So uh, um, now I'd like to uh, um, talk to you a little bit about another aspect of control strategies uh, for drug products when it comes to NDSRIs. And that's specifically when the precursor amines are impurities in the API rather than the API itself. First of all, the disclaimer, these are the views of myself and not my employer. So back in uh, November 2021 at uh, the Association for Accessible Medicine's uh, annual technical conference, um, this was now, what, three years into the nitrosamine saga at this point, starting with the discovery of NDMA and Valsartan in 2018, uh, as, as has been mentioned earlier today. Um, the issuance of the FDA guidance on nitrosamines in human drugs in September 2020. We come around to November 2021, and, and what did we already know at that point uh, about both simple nitrosamines and NDSRIs? Um, that the raw materials are often direct sources, not direct sources of the nitrosamines themselves, uh, but are actually the sources of precursors, with APIs particularly being uh, sources of amine precursors. Also, the excipients are important, but mainly as nitrosation sources. At the time, we'd indicated that there was still an enormous amount to be understood about the kinetics of inadvertent nitrosation in drug products, especially solid dose drugs. And I would say this remains true today. So I'm gonna focus on a particular aspect of control strategy options. You've heard presented this morning, and you'll be hearing more presentations later in this morning's session uh, about some of those control strategy options. The first one, and it, this will be spoken about the set in this afternoon session, and I think the most important one, is quantifying the potency of NDSRIs, because um, that's what your target will be. And if it turns out that we have ways to assess that particular NDSRIs are relatively non-potent, that's the most important control strategy of all. Uh, beyond that, um, we have also sessions covering the introduction of additives to drug products to suppress nitrosation. Again, that's going to be addressed in this session. And then we come to control of precursors uh, to NDSRIs. So nitrosation species are principally in the excipients. Sanders spoke about that just now and the opportunities to use excipients with lower quantities of nitrosating species. What I'm going to focus on are NDSRI secondary amine impurities uh, that mainly come from APIs. To do that though, I uh, have to focus first on something uh, to lay the stage, if you will, uh, where the API itself is the precursor. This really came to public attention in uh, 2021 with the discovery of nitrosovarenicline in varenicline uh, drug product. Uh, that's a smoking cessation product, many of you will know. Um, I've got a little bit small here, but I do have what was published by the FDA, had been evaluating products uh, that were on the market or could be on the market at that time uh, for the levels of nitrosovarenicline. And the only reason that I'm showing this is just to give you a sense of the range that was being found in the drug products at that time. So from the previous slide, if you look over on the right, the highest level that had been reported by the FDA at the time was 474 ppm. But if you think about this as a synthetic chemist, this is only 0.04% molar conversion of the substrate that is varenicline free base itself to the nitrosamine. Despite the fact that if you thought about this in concentration as a reaction, you've actually got four molar of your substrate present in the system. 
I can tell you coming from the API side of the world, if as an API process developer, synthetic chemist, you came to your supervisor and said, yay, I achieved 0.04% conversion in this reaction, you would not be getting a pat on the back. So, um, and what does that really mean? This is not in a very, very efficient process. So what are the broad hypotheses um, that would account for that? Well, the first one, and I think that's what Sander was touching on, is it may be nitrosation limited. You have plenty of amine substrate, but the drug product really doesn't have that much nitrite or nitrosating source available in it to cause extensive conversion. But there's a second one, and that's, this is going to be important for later, uh, is that how available is the amine substrate? Uh, the graphics you see below the, uh, uh, the synthetic scheme there uh, are the known, uh, known crystal forms of varenicline tartrate. The one in yellow boxed in the center is crystal form B. Uh, that's the one that's actually in product or used by most manufacturers now in the product. Um, all three forms uh, have the same motif though. You're looking edge on at sheets of varenicline free base uh, and you can see that all three forms have a similar motif then interlaced with uh, sheets of tartrate anion. Uh, so important thing to consider here, if you imagine that yellow box as being a crystallite of the API, the, uh, um, what's most likely to be happening when nitrosation is occurring from with a nitrite source being the excipients, it's going to be the most accessible base that reacts first. The uh, blue dashed box conceptually um, shows that as a, a layer of accessible varenicline base at the surface of the crystal. Presumably, uh, as one goes deeper into the crystal, that the, the subsequent layers are less available for reaction for nitrosation, and that could go a long way to explaining the limited conversion uh, that in fact uh, the paper that Justin was authored, authoring on uh, was showing too. So, that shows you perhaps a worse case where you have an amine precursor in a drug product. Um, but there's another important consideration is, what about products where the API is not the precursor, but it contains secondary amine APIs or impurities? Um, so from a paper uh, in, published in the fall by Schlingemann et al, and in fact, David Ponting is one of the authors on this paper and he'll be speaking this afternoon. They, uh, amongst other things, surveyed all the possible NDSRIs that could exist using various databases. And what I want to point out is what's uh, boxed in purple here is specifically out of the USP database, impurities that themselves are secondary amines in uh, USP monographed products. You can see there are uh, 720 different possible secondary amines as impurities uh, in, in USP products alone. There are also, just to the right of that, a large number of tertiary amines, but I, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that tertiary amines present the same kind of risk for form, forming uh, nitro NDSRIs in the way that secondary amines do. To make this a little more concrete, I'm showing an example set here of, of USP monographed products. So this is the family of tertiary amine uh, tricyclic antidepressants, been around a long time, very well genericized. Um, and so you're seeing the APIs at the top. They themselves are, none of those are secondary amines, but you see each one of them has at least one secondary amine purity associated with it. The other thing I want to point out here is that <clears throat> the, uh, the, what are the levels that are allowable of these precursors by USP monograph specifications? You see they range anywhere from 0.1%, so it's 1,000 ppm, uh, all the way up to uh, 5,000 ppm in, in, uh, in one case. So these are very significant levels of precursor compared to the typical levels we're seeing for the allowed corresponding NDSRI in the drug product. There's no shortage of precursor here. How do we measure this today? Well, I, I think we all know <clears throat> these precursor amines that are present as impurities in products, typically measured by, uh, by uh, um, chromatographic methods, mainly HPLC, UV, uh, HPLC uh, UPLC, uh, and GC methods uh, as well with UV detection. As I pointed out earlier, precursor levels are generally at, uh, present at the allowable ICH Q3A, Q3B levels, converting that to PPM and taking rounding into account. That means in the, in the range of 1,500 to 2,500 PPM. <clears throat> in principle, that means if it were all reacted, almost the same amount of NDSRI, 
could form if it were not nitrosation limited. The important idea, though, to capture here is solution phase measurement, which is what's done now exclusively, only measures the average content of impurity amine precursors. It doesn't teach us anything about the, what I call, microspatial distribution of those amine precursor impurities in and amongst the individual crystallites of crystalline APIs. That spatial location of nitrosation susceptible amine impurities relative to the API could significantly influence the nitrosation kinetics. So to tie that to another idea, what about anisotropic impurity incorporation in crystals? So this is work not stemming from nitrosamines, but for different reasons. What I'm showing you here, uh, that colored image is a photomicrograph of a potassium sulfate crystal that's been grown in the presence of sulforotamine B uh, dye, a, a laser fluorescence dye that's used. And you can see it, that's a, that's a tablet-shaped crystal, uh, orthorhombic uh, space group for, the, for potassium sulfate. It's a spectacular example of anisotropic incorporation of an impurity into a crystal structure. You can see it's only being incorporated on the crystal faces that are growing vertically on this image and not at all in the uh, lateral direction. So that if you can have this kind of anisotropy in how impurities are incorporated uh, into crystals of API, this is not an API, it's a mineral, but to illustrate the point, you can imagine there are other ways this could happen. What are, you know, what are the other ways in which impurities could be distributed uh, in, uh, in APIs? Well, I'm gonna tie now in some work uh, collaborative work by uh, researchers at particularly Boringer Ingelheim, at Justin's company, Merck, um, and at Rowan University in New Jersey. Uh, they've done a series of papers over the last three years, the most recent one being published uh, just last month, about impurity retention mechanisms focused on APIs, but this applies to any organic chemical. Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up, again, this research was being done from a particular perspective. It was from uh, scientists in the area of API development trying to understand better how to control impurity purge when producing products. This was not about nitrosamines, but it's going to turn out that I think it has a great relevance to our nitrosamine situation today. So just to give you a really quick overview, uh, I'm terrible about time, so I should actually look at the clock. Uh, um, what we have here are the basic impurity retention mechanisms, nice, nicely shown in a cartoon. Over on the left, we'll call it lattice incorporation. And here, the white squares represent your target solute, so your API. Uh, the yellow circles and or hexagons represent an impurity. You can see in those cases, the impurity is embedded within the crystals in various ways. The other big category is external retention, where the impurity is not co-crystallizing inside uh, the, uh, if we'll call it API lattice, but is external by surface in, uh, adsorption, entrapment, or separate crystallization. So keep those two broad categories in mind. Our current testing for impurity levels in APIs doesn't distinguish these things. It has no way of distinguishing them. Um, what uh, um, Nordstrom and coworkers worked out is a very clever way to get some understanding of this distribution. And I don't have time to go into the details. I do have the paper reference here, and then it references predecessor papers on the topic. They've come up with something called the SLIP test, and SLIP stands for Solubility Limited Impurity Purge. Again, it would take too long to go through the, the math of this, but the nice thing about the technique, which doesn't involve any new exotic instrumentation, you can use HPLC and crystallization studies, you can actually determine the type of, crystal, of impurity incorporation that's happening in a given material by selective dissolution of, of the uh, material, in this case, APIs. Um, and a nice thing in their most recent paper, what they've done is, is gathered together the statistics on all the systems that have been studied about how related compound impurities are incorporated uh, into, um, for example, APIs. And with this next slide, I can show you uh, that distribution. Again, keep in mind the two broad categories, lattice incorporation, that's embedded impurity that's ensconced within your, your API crystal, and then externally retained, um, externally retained impurities. So here, the solid solutions pie chart there, 
Solid solutions are lattice embedded impurities in various modes. They could be co crystals, it can be true solid solutions, they can be uh, inclusions. But the nice thing to see here is about three quarters of all the systems studied show the impurity, which is structurally similar to the, the solute or the API in this case, are, are incorporated. They're internally incorporated impurities. From an NDSRI perspective, that's encouraging because that should mean if this, this um, characteristic holds broadly across APIs, generally the closely related compounds should form solid solutions, statistically speaking, more often than not. I mean, you do see the red and the blue there represent ones where the impurity is external to the API, therefore potentially more available for reaction, and, then, um, and that has a different consequence than uh, if they're solid solutions. But the nice thing is this is a way that one can use to evaluate the API and to risk rank impurity precursor amines uh, in, uh, in APIs as part of your overall drug product risk assessment. I'll give a specific case uh, here again, again from public domain information, uh, where this might be able to be applied. Maybe Justin would know if it is already being applied at Merck, I, I can't say. Um, but um, so here we have citagliptin phosphate. Last summer, uh, the FDA did announce that uh, another NDSRI called NTTP uh, was detected in citagliptin products. What I'm showing here is the original MedChem synthesis uh, for, for citagliptin, and the reason is specifically, if you look down in the lower left, the purple boxed key starting material, uh, which we'll just call TPP for conveni convenience here, is an important, it's both a starting material to the final API, and because it's in the form of an amide, it is also a potential degradant of the API itself. Um, again, I've given uh, the numbers on the right, the uh, what the long-term internationally accepted acceptable intake for NTTP is and what an interim limit has been assigned at the moment so you, you can you can see that uh, we're talking about levels that are somewhere in the in the range of one ppm of NTTP being present in, in the drug product uh, like I say it can be both there as an impurity to start uh, and it can be uh, could potentially come as a degradant later on so I would say this is a good example for evaluating by slip. How is the TTP distributed uh, in the citagliptin, here it's citagliptin phosphate monohydrate, how is it di distributed in that product? It's, um, you know, uh, I don't know Merck's specification and I shouldn't, but it wouldn't be surprising if it's the Q3A limit, which would be 1500 ppm for TTP, it's not a genotoxic impurity itself. Um, but that's about, high, about a thousand times higher than the levels of NTTP being found in the product. Again, so uh, to determine how that's distributed, a slip test, it would be a good candidate for slip test. Uh, also, a slip test is appro appropriate for the degradation product because it's an amide hydrolysis here. It's not obvious that that hydrolysis is happening only in the surface of crystals in the drug product. There's water, this is a monohydrate form. There's water, in, you know, uniformly throughout the crystallite itself. This could help to distinguish even for degradation uh, TTP that forms, whether that's uh, more surface and available or more interior or uniformly distributed. Okay, so I'll just take a moment to summarize um, the options that we have for control strategies with respect to impurity amines. Um, first one is, is your NDSRI uh, actually possible? Unfortunately, most of the ones you can conceive of to form do actually form, but a few don't. For example, the calcium channel blocker uh, APIs don't form stable nitrosamines, even though structurally you might think they would. Um, that's the first pass towards a control strategy. If it's not there, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the second is to limit or reduce impurity secondary amine precursors in APIs, where the APIs are not vulnerable themselves to nitrosation. Um, you know, the fact that allowed Q3AB limits are of the order of, of uh, 1,000 ppm or so, 1,500 ppm, that means the precursors there at 10 to 1,000 times greater than would be necessary to exceed an NDSRI limit and their prima facie risks themselves. So what can you do about that? Well, where required, you can engage current API suppliers to evaluate uh, process modifications to reduce amine precursors in their product. 
This will, in, in most cases, increase the cost of the API. They're going to have to do more processing or changes. That doesn't come for free. It may provoke supplier pushback. I can tell you in, in my role, I deal with a lot of API suppliers, and that's generally the experience I have. They don't like hearing about this. Um, it, may, it may require, too, and this is another knock-on consequence, if one determines that in one's drug product, much lower levels of amine precursor have to be maintained in the drug product in order to have an NDSRI control uh, strategy that, that's working, that may require a lot of MS-based LC methods to be now applied to secondary amine impurities that otherwise were just the UVHPLC methods. So those of us who are working heavily on, in the nitrosamines control space, which is basically everyone in this room, knows how heavily LCMS is being used to, to deal with these studies. This will, this will add an additional burden if it turns out to be the case. And that's why it's so important to determine if we can de-risk some amine impurities and then not have to go to setting levels uh, down at the ones to tens of ppm. Of course, and, and I know others who have spoken today, and there'll be more presentations on this, um, conduct API binary excipient compatibility studies. I think most companies are doing that already. They are beneficial, they are necessary, but they're time consuming and may not always reflect the kinetics of NDSRI formation in the final drug product. Um, and uh, then the main point of uh, my presentation, we can enhance product nitrosamine risk assessments by using an API slip test as a new tool. Uh, I'm not saying there isn't, it's a fair amount of experimentation itself, but at least it's not involving new exotic instrumentation, you know, at the added costs. Um, and it's something that uh, those of us on the drug product side of things can uh, jointly work to influence and FDA can too, API suppliers to take a more active role in this because they're the ones who can actually do this kind of work even more easily. Finally, as a bit of a um, positive note, the studies done by Nordstrom and, and co-authors so far indicate that most secondary mean impurities are incorporated as internally retained uh, in the uh, API crystal lattice, statistically speaking, so that is encouraging for us. It should uh, somewhat help to limit the number of NDSRIs stemming from this risk factor. Finally, the, the, this type of slip test can help uh, generic and brand companies alike when you're either qualifying a new API supplier, and the reason I say this is for, uh, with respect to the NDSRI, uh, and the precursor amine that comes in their API because um, different crystallization systems may result in the same impurity in the same API distributing differently from, from one manufacturer to another. And this would be a way to distinguish that. Or if one is introducing a radically new final isolation process in one's existing API to see if that has an impact. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, again, my name is Dia Shaklia. I present uh, uh, Office of Testing and Research uh, at OPQ. So I will be presenting today the, uh, uh, some of the case study that we worked on uh, uh, at, the, at Cedar Laboratories to study the mitigations of, uh, of the NDSR, NDSRIs using uh, antioxidants. So if I can go on. Okay, this is my disclaimers, and since my colleagues uh, uh, went through these uh, uh, slides, so I will just pass them, uh, skip them. So uh, my presentation outline will be on, uh, and Andre mentioned about these, the, 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 the sources of these uh, contamination, nitrosamine contaminations. Then I'll talk about the, the mitigation strategies that we, uh, we looked at uh, in the lab uh, for the past uh, 2022 and uh, talking about the case study. Uh, since the drug is not yet, uh, the, the, the research work was not yet published, so I will just call it a drug A. And this is a secondary amine that is uh, susceptible for the uh, uh, NDSRI formation. And finally, my conclusion. 
as, as my colleagues mentioned here, you need a favorable conditions for these amines to form. And, uh, and we looked at actually the different conditions uh, we mentioned, uh, my, my colleagues mentioned before about the, the pH sensitivity on nitrosamine formations. Also, uh, uh, as Andre mentioned about the sources of this nitrosamine, where can uh, this nitrosamine uh, 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 present, so uh, how it comes from. Uh, we looked at very deeply here in, uh, in the excipients, uh, especially the contamination of the uh, 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 nitrite and some of the excipient that was used uh, for the manufacturing of this, uh, of, of this drug. So based on the information gathered internally and externally, we looked at uh, uh, some of these strategies, uh, starting with using antioxidant. Selective antioxidant based on the informations, we used uh, three different antioxidant at three different concentration levels. We also looked at the uh, uh, varying the, the pH of the formulation of the drug product, if that's going to affect the, uh, the formation of the NDSR, uh, NDSRI. So the first strategy, we looked at the antioxidant. What are the, the different antioxidant that can be used at what concentrations, uh, what levels in the drug product? So uh, we, we came up with the three antioxidant, ascorbic acid, uh, caffeic acid, and ferulic acid at three different concentrations. Uh, we decided to use 0.1%, uh, 0.5%, uh, uh, and 1% of the antioxidants. Also, we looked at the, at the pH changing the pH of the formulations uh, uh, at what stage of the manufacturing. So we, we, uh, we used uh, uh, hydrochloric acid to uh, reduce the pH around to three. And also we uh, used sodium bicarbonate to uh, increase the pH to around eight and to study the uh, formation of this NDSRI at the drug product. Also, we looked at the, uh, the effects of uh, heat and moisture. And uh, uh, it's really uh, important to understand how the heat and the moisture can affect the, the final formation of this NDSRI and the drug product. So uh, we did a few experiments to understand this uh, phenomenon. This is the workflow that we, uh, we worked on uh, to understand first this, uh, the drug A that uh, we used here as a model uh, molecule. Uh, we looked at the uh, uh, the drug product actually in the market. Uh, we so we got this drug product and we we did some screening of that drug product. Uh, we looked at the excipients that's used in that drug product and the effect of each excipients on the formation of the and the SRI. With that information, we went ahead and formulate 26 different formulations, including all these uh, antioxidants. Uh, at different levels, and also we va va varied the uh, the pH uh, on some of this formulation. Uh, please note that each formulation that we formulated here with the different antioxidant, we we included also a, 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 a control uh, product. So make sure that to see the only effect of this antioxidant, not something else. Uh, after having the formulation, final formulation, we did a normal characterization of the tablets, including all the moisture content, uh, uh, all the hardness, and other other uh, parameters. And also, at different stages, we looked at the uh, content of this nitrite and the nitro, so the NDSRI, at different levels of manufacturing. And finally, we took all this formulation and we kept them uh, for stability under different uh, temperature, humidity. Uh, and this was done for six month uh, accelerated uh, studies. So as I mentioned, we did uh, initial uh, effort screening to understand the, uh, the effectiveness of this antioxidant that we selected. So we took the marketed drug product, we, uh, we did a control, we kept them for 50, 75, for 12 days. Uh, we looked at the, the NDSRI formation. Uh, uh, some of these tablets also we crushed them, uh, we spiked them with the nitrite to, to simulate the or to enhance the, uh, the, the NDSRI formation and then in the other batch we spiked this antioxidant at 1% and to see the effectiveness of this uh, uh, antioxidant on the mitigation of the NDSRI. Uh, as, as, as I mentioned previously also we looked at the 
the, all these exhibient that's part of this formulation uh, uh, by itself and in combination with the API uh, binary mixture, as my previous speaker mentioned, uh, and we saw, we looked at the uh, NDSRI formation. This was kept for, uh, for, for one month, and we studied at room temperature as well as the, uh, 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 this, this high temperature and humidity. So based on this information, uh, screening study information, we went ahead and, and, and established our in-house formulations, looking at different stages of manufacturing, uh, starting with the mixing the API uh, with the with the excipients, uh, uh, the granulation step, and also when we added the final <coughs> extra granule to make the, the, the tablets. At different stages, we looked at the uh, uh, all this pH, uh, we measured the pH, we measured the, the NDSRI, we measured the nitrite. Uh, we looked at different parameters just to understand changing these parameters or changing the uh, addition of, of this antioxidant, what, what, what it affects uh, uh, at the final product. Uh, as you see here, we, we formulated 26 formulation, different concentration of antioxidants, and also uh, we changed the pH. We used the pH modifier. Uh, 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 to, make, to ensure that the tablet, the final tablet has that pH uh, uh, that we are looking for. After having these formulations, we kept them for uh, stability under different two conditions, 4075 and 2560 uh, for six months. Just, just to make sure that uh, we, we understood the process of uh, manufacturing and each step of the manufacturing it affects the the NDSRI formation or mitigation. So, uh, running number of these formulations understood the uh, we reached out to the uh, that antioxidant the best time or the best way of using uh, antioxidant efficiently is to mix uh, with the API at the first stage before introducing other parameters. So uh, we, we, we did that, and uh, also uh, among of the other uh, uh, parameters that we, we analyzed how you mix this antioxidant with the, with, with the API. So we did a number of formulations to, to, under, to, to understand is, is the mixing of antioxidant, is, is, uh, uh, it will affect the final formation of the NDSRIs. And then we did the, uh, the other important step is the granulation step. Uh, uh, introducing a moisture during granulation step, it did affect uh, the NDSRI uh, formations and also it affects also the, 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 the performance of the antioxidant uh, when it is added at that stage. Another important uh, step here during manufacturing is the drying step. Uh, in this process, we used two, two, two drying steps. We used the, the initial oven uh, temperature uh, for, for, uh, uh, for 45 minutes, and we looked at the, uh, uh, the NDSRI formed at that stage. And then we did further uh, drying using the fluid uh, bed dryer uh, uh, at this condition at 60 degrees. And we, we also looked at if there is an increase of NDSRI after using these two different uh, drying uh, steps. And finally, having these uh, granules, adding the extra granular portion and, and final compression. Also, we looked at the formation of this NDSRI. So we, we monitor the formation of NDSRI throughout the manufacturing process. As I mentioned that we looked at the, we, we, we characterized these tablets. We looked also at the moisture at each step to ensure that the effect of the uh, moisture as well as the pH on the formation of the NDSRI. And just to present some of the data that uh, uh, we gathered during the screening studies of this drug product. We, uh, as you see here, the bar, the, the, the bar graph here, for, and the blue bar graph is the at day zero of the, the drug product itself without adding anything. And uh, when you, uh, we took this drug product and uh, exposed it to high temperature, and, and humidity we see, if you see the first uh, 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 paragraph here, uh, you see the increase, the orange line here, or the orange uh, paragraph, you see increase of the, uh, the, 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 the NDSRI uh, uh, in, in many folds. 
when you expose it to high temperature and, and humidity. Adding the ascorbic acid, caffeic acid, and, nitro, uh, and uh, uh, ferulic acid, you see here uh, the ascorbic acid, the, first, the second line, it, you see how it mitigates most of these NDSRI formation. And this, was, this study was done, uh, I believe, for, uh, for, 12, uh, for 12 days uh, study. So uh, comparing the room temperature, which is the blue paragraph, compared to the orange, that's the difference in the temperature. The room temperature, it did affect the formation of the NDSRI, but high temperature and humidity, it really it, uh, it facilitated this formation of the NDSRI. Important aspect here also, we created the binary mixtures between the API and the individual excipients to understand uh, the, which excipient that formed, that facilitated the, the formation of NDSRI. Also, we looked at the room temperature and, and uh, the uh, 5075 uh, conditions. And as you see here, uh, uh, Avisol stood out and showed that room temperature, it did increase at room temperature for uh, 30 days, it did increase the NDSRI, uh, but looking at after uh, uh, incubating it with the or step, uh, 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 with the 5075, it it really increased it to almost 12 folds. So that shows that the the exposure of this uh, uh, API, the secondary amine with the excipient that has the nitrite. It really affected the, the formation of this in the SRIs. Uh, another, this, this is an important parameter that we wanted to monitor, especially adding these antioxidant. Antioxidant, they are acids. So we want to make sure that what is the final pH of the formulation compared to the, if you see the last ones, uh, uh, adding this uh, hydrochloric acid to reduce the pH and also sodium bicarbonate to maintain the, the alkaline pH. So just we wanted to, to, to monitor the pH throughout the, the different formulation when we added the different concentration of this uh, antioxidant. This is just a summary of one of the uh, uh, data that we collected at 2560 for six months. As you see here, the, f the first blue line, uh, uh, the control, is this is just uh, the formulation itself without adding anything. It's the tablet keeping it for six months and studying the, the formation of NDSRI. You see how it, uh, the NDSRI increases uh, with time at, uh, at that temperature, at that conditions. And then looking at the different lines here, uh, you see the uh, incorporating or co incorporating the uh, uh, the antioxidants affected the uh, or helped in reducing mitigating the NDSRI formation. If you see the 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 the, uh, the yellow line, the, the at the bottom is this is one percent of ascorbic acid. It has almost mitigated the uh, the the formation of the uh, the NDSRI through all the six month stability studies. And if you see the first line, which is the pH, the alkaline pH using sodium bicarbonate, we saw almost, uh, almost 90, 92% uh, uh, inhibition of this NDSRI uh, formation. Presenting the data, the same data in, uh, in terms of percent inhibition efficiency of this antioxidant, the first three uh, uh, paragraphs, so it, it represents the the percent inhibition efficiency of the ascorbic acid at different concentration, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 1%. At also comparing the, the two different conditions at 4075 and 2560. And you see here is the, uh, at 1%, if you, uh, 92% of the, of the NDSRI, NDSRI were, uh, 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 was inhibited using uh, this ascorbic acid. Uh, compared to the 81% uh, at 2560. So higher temperature and, and humidity helped and also in, in mitigating the NDSRI when you use this antioxidant. And then look at the different antioxidant, ferrolic acid, caffeic acid. Uh, you see the difference in, in between the temperature, stability temperature, how the, the 4075 uh, 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 facilitated the antioxidant, uh, uh, especially these antioxidant 
they have a solubility differences. So uh, uh, I believe with, 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 with higher temperature and, and humidity, it, it helped uh, the antioxidant to uh, prevent the uh, formation of this antiox uh, uh, of NDS, NDSRI. And then the, uh, the, uh, the last uh, uh, paragraph here, you showed the, uh, we showed here the uh, effect of the sodium bicarbonate uh, uh, for miti to, to mitigate the NDSRI. So just to summary my uh, to summarize my my talk about the antioxidant so uh, the study that we did particularly to this API uh, uh, we found out that ascorbic acid uh, uh, was the highest in mitigating the NDSRI in the final formulation at six month stability uh, we understood this antioxidants uh, it can be used uh, in, in a separate way, in a different way uh, with the API. It depends on the drug substance, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, and formulations. And also from this study, we understood that increasing, you need to titrate the concentration of this antioxidant uh, uh, to mitigate, to have the better mitigation of the, of the NDSRI. And also uh, the pH, we confirmed that pH is really uh, one of the factors that affects the, uh, the formation of NDSRI. So maintaining the neutral pH uh, or slightly alkaline, it can help in, in mitigating the, uh, the formation of NDSRIs. And finally, the, the heat and moisture. Heat and moisture, we, we saw that, that the difference when we increase the temperature stability for six months, we see the difference in, in the mitigation using this different anti, antioxidants. So definitely, my understanding continuous manufacturing using direct compression it's maybe it's one of the way to reduce this nitrosamine uh, uh, formation and with that i just want to thank our uh, my colleagues from different offices for their contribution to this project and this uh, this work was uh, recently uh, submitted for publication and it's accepted, but I could not mention about the name because I have not received the final acceptance. So it should be, it should be out soon in a week or two. And thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. Um, so hello to everyone, both here and uh, virtually. Uh, my name is Marko Trampus. Um, I come from Early Development Department in Sandos in Slovenia. And I'm very pleased to be able to present you our work um, that's been done a bit more than a year ago. Um, so on finding effective nitrite scavengers and then using them as inhibitors of uh, nitrosamine formation so um, in drug products, both in solution and in solid state, uh, so on different model means. Um, so this is how our um, research was kind of organized, and this is also how I will present you the, um, the, the study today. So we first performed a thorough literature investigation on already known nitrite scavengers. We then shortlisted some compounds for experimental screening of their nitrite scavenging. Uh, activity and then we wanted or then we decided to evaluate the best performing compounds also so how well they inhibit nitrosamine formation in solution and also in model tablets now um, nitrosamine formation doesn't really need no specific introduction um, so as Andre um, nicely um, pointed out so for pharmaceutical products the most relevant nitrosation conditions are so presence of a secondary amine presence of nitrite and acidic medium um, nitrites are kind of seen as the main culprit um, i should say um, and of course they're widespread in water in api now we all know their um, widespread presence in excipients also different nitri nitrogen oxides can be present in air. Um, so the idea to uh, mitigate nitrosamine formation via nitrite scavenging, um, say it's not really new. Uh, in fact, it has been known in food industry for decades. 
Um, there has been plenty of studies showing that various antioxidants, um, so for example, vitamin C, uh, vitamin E, um, effectively prevent um, nitrosamine formation um, by scavenging nitrite, both in vitro and in vivo. Um, now, about at the same time where we decided to conduct our research, the FDA um, really um, motivated us additionally by publishing this well-known uh, document where, um, say, nitrite scavenging has been seen as one of the three strategies uh, for mitigation uh, of this um, NDSRI formation. Uh, and at about the same time as well, um, this well-known study by, by Merck was also published, which was kind of the first study where they evaluated some nitrite scavengers as uh, nitrosamine formation inhibitors. Uh, so um, we decided to, um, let's say, do our own research and really base uh, based it on the assumption that an effective nitrite scavenger will also be an effective nitrosamine formation inhibitor. Now, we perform a thorough literature investigation and um, a plethora of different organic and inorganic compounds have been documented to react and deplete the concentrations of nitrite. Uh, of course, yeah, for pharmaceutical use, not all compounds are useful. So we focused on the compounds that have, um, let's say, low toxicological risk. And of course, it's not only holds for the compound, but also for the reaction product. So between the scavenger and the, and the nitrite, uh, ideally, they would be suitable so um, or listed on this inactive ingredient for approved drug products uh, database. Um, and of course, we also wanted the reaction with nitrite to be as fast as possible and, um, and complete. So we shortlisted 19 scavengers based on literature data. Uh, so most of the compounds, let's say, were various antioxidants. Um, I won't go into all the, all the, all the names here. Um, we selected also several amino acids that work by, by a different mechanism. Uh, some inorganic salts um, and also some various compounds that say that um, I guess could be grouped also with the other. So it, this is, you know, just for uh, for clarity. Uh, 17 of those compounds are included in this uh, approved direct product. So in this in inactive ingredient database, only two compounds are not. So resveratrol as an antioxidant and paraminobenzoic acid. Uh, but they are known dietary supplements, so let's say they are um, they could be acceptable. Now we perform the screening of this nitrite scavenging activity under four different um, pharmaceutically relevant conditions in solution. So under two different pHs, three and five, um, and two different temperatures, twenty and fifty degrees. So four different combinations. Now, we uh, perform nitrite um, concentration measurement um, using this nitrite uh, test strips. Um, so we wanted to have a method that was really fast, simple, that could be really used, you know, um, um, so um, um, used as, I guess, as a suitable screening method. Uh, and then, yeah, so we performed all the experiments. Uh, so control was just nitrite without any scavenger and then all different scavengers. Here I am showing the results. So at pH three and twenty degrees Celsius, uh, and the dark blue line is let's say the control and so the concentration, just the nitrite without any scavenger. We can see that the concentration drops even uh, in time. So even if any scavenger is if no scavenger is present, and then all scavengers somewhat lowered the concentration, but of course to a different extent. So for us, let's say some sort of a cutoff. So how to really to choose which compounds to uh, say take the further investigation was complete consumption of nitrite in 20 hours and of course most conditions so also the other three combinations and we shortlisted six different scavengers so ascorbic acid and sodium ascorbate already known compounds um, then maltol propyl gallate paraminobenzoic acid and cysteine as in the only amino acid um, and then as the next step, we then investigated how well these 
six nitrite scavengers perform in inhibiting nitrosamine formation. And for this purpose, we chose two different model amines. So two secondary amines, one aromatic methyl aniline shown on the, on the left side, and one aliphatic, so phenyl piperazine. So these could kind of serve as, let's say, model APIs, uh, because the structural motif is quite widespread in different, um, in different compound, uh, drug substances. Now, all scavengers were shown to be active, so nitrosation inhibitors, but to a much different extent. First of all, I would like to point out that um, methyl aniline, so the graph on the left, was completely nitrosated, so 100% conversion in around half an hour already, while phenylpiperazine was, let's say, converted only to about like 5%, so 20 times less. Now, the most effective scavenger, um, so let's say inhibitor for methyl aniline or nitroso methyl aniline formation was surprisingly paraminobenzoic acid, uh, closely followed then by ascorbic acid and cysteine. The same three compounds were also active in preventing nitroso phenylpiperazine formation and pretty much quantitatively, so just traces of the nitrosamine were detected. Maltol and propyl gallate were less active, but still battled and so control without any scavenger. And then we also, as a second part, evaluated the activity of, of these scavengers in solid state. So first we had to formulate, so we had to prepare, um, so, um, uh, hydrochloride salts of methyl aniline and phenylpiperazine, so they have solid compounds that could be formulated. And then we formulated them together, so with microcrystalline cellulose, um, povidone, and uh, magnesium stearate into tablets around 100 milligrams um, weight. 10% of that amount was API, and we added so around one tenth, so um, ratio between the API and the scavenger was around 10 to 1. So we manufacture those using so wet granulation, um, and then we uh, first measured the concentration of nitrosamines, so just after manufacturing, and then we exposed the, the tablets also to stress conditions, so 28 days of 50 degrees Celsius and 75% relative humidity, and then we measured the concentration of nitrosamines afterwards as well. Now, if we first look at the results for, for the methyl anilines or the nitroso methyl aniline, if you will, we were quite surprised that a large amount of nitroso methyl aniline was formed in all different samples. So already during tableting, so before any stress testing. Uh, so the left graph uh, actually shows the tablets without any spiking and the graph on the right actually shows um, the results where microcrystalline cellulose was spiked with some additional sodium nitrite so 2 ppm and as you can see so none of the scavengers really made any significant improvement um, so especially uh, where no nitrite was spiked in fact, during so in um, in samples where nitri nitrite was spiked, there was actually some increase in nitrosamine formation. What was most interesting was that after stress testing, no nitrosamine could be detected. So it was below limit of detection in all the samples, uh, which was in a way quite surprising. But since it is an aromatic nitrosamine, um, some sort of degradation or instability has already been known in the literature for such compounds. Now, when it comes to phenylpiperazine or nitrosophenylpiperazine, if you will, um, not much was formed during manufacturing. However, there was quite significant formation during stress test. Here, luckily, or let's say um, we were very uh, satisfied that some scavengers actually showed some inhibition. Uh, again, the same ones that were also active in solution. So ascorbic acid, paraminobenzoic acid and L-cysteine. But surprisingly, sodium ascorbate, so just the sodium salt of, of ascorbic acid, highly promoted nitroso phenylpiperazine formation. Uh, this has not yet been known in the literature for this particular compound, but it has been known that scavengers can, of course, also promote nitrosamine formation under certain conditions. Now, to conclude, I would not really repeat, let's say, the, the, the main um, 
the main, uh, let's say, uh, results. Uh, definitely, we have observed that all evaluated nitride scavengers did lower. So uh, the formation of nitrosamines in solution, some also in solid state. What I would especially like to emphasize at this point is that, um, let's say, our assumption that a good nitride scavenger will also be a good nitrosamine inhibitor uh, does not really hold not even in solution and especially not in a solid state. So we cannot just, let's say, linearly predict, um, let's, say let's say, nitrization inhibition activity just from the nitrite scavenging data. Also, we have shown that paraminobenzoic acid has been, let's say, for the first time in a pharmaceutical product um, shown to be effective as, a, as, a, as an inhibitor. So um, maybe that uh, could somehow um, be worth in taking into consideration that let's say some additional compounds so not just paraminobenzoic acid but let's say all compounds that show some activity as nitrosamine um, inhibitors uh, could be then potentially included or in in the so uh, this inactive ingredient database since of course this is a uh, compounds with such activity will probably be more and more widespread used um, let's say in drug products and also something that hasn't really been pointed out today yet, but I also think it is quite of a large significance. You can see here the visual changes of tablets after stress test. And I would especially like to uh, point out so the second, third, and the last column, because those are ascorbic acid, sodium ascorbate, and paraminobenzoic acid. And compared to the first column, it was like control, so without any scavenger, we see that the color of the tablets changed quite considerably. So the last ones are almost black, uh, and the ones with ascorbate, acid, and ascorbate also were brownish. So uh, this is also something taking, that has to be taken into consideration. So regarding whole compatibility, stability, and of course also the let's say, any toxicological profile of these um, of these various um, colored products. Um, in any case, this is a strategy with high potential, um, but as Dia also nicely mentioned, it is, let's say, um, something that has to be evaluated case by case, really depending on the API, on the dosage form, on the, let's say, whole manufacturing process, um, what are like, the compatibilities between different, different species, the whole stability, and so on. Uh, so in the end, I would um, really like to acknowledge um, all the other so colleagues uh, from Sandoz that have participated in this research. Uh, most of them were also co-authors on the paper that was published, so in processes at the end of last year. Uh, so special thanks to to, to Zdenko um, Chasar. Then uh, thank you very much yeah, for organization of this event. Uh, so not just University of Maryland, but also yeah, to the whole so center for research on complex generics and FDA. Um, and yeah, thank you all for your attention. Hello. We can hear you, sir. Go ahead. Uh, can you allow me to share my screen? OK. I cannot switch on my video. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. OK, thank you. Uh, so sorry, I tried to switch on the camera, but <clears throat> it was not allowed. Anyway, my name is Rog Rahek. I'm coming from Sando, uh, also from Slovenia as the presenter. And <clears throat> I will talk about the nitrite in excipients. And uh, uh, the overall talk will be, will be about the analytical technique the nitrite in excipients, uh, 
the effect of uh, NOx nitrogen oxides, which are in the air, uh, and the contribution of this to the nitrate in excipients. And also, <clears throat> I will pre uh, show a case study uh, what is the effect of the nitrogen oxide uh, during the tablet production. So just the first short overview of the analytical techniques. We can uh, say that we have a direct method, which can be ion chromatography with that direct uh, uh, detection uh, conduct conductometry or mass spectrometry, or the other one uh, with derivatization, where we can have a UV spectrometry, HPLC separation, capillary electrophoresis separation, and detection with UV fluorescence and mass spectrometry. So uh, what are actually the requirements? Uh, we have heard a lot about nitriting in our products and uh, we know that they are quite harmful and we, we need to go quite low. So uh, we need to have a robust method. We need to have a fast method. The method should be quite sensitive so we can go down to 10 to 50 ppb. Uh, the recovery should be good so the method should be uh, validated. And of course, we need the, the analytical tool not to be too expensive. Uh, regarding the uh, detection limits, the conductometry, it's not really the, the most sensitive. The UV after derivatization is a bit more. Fluorescence is quite good. And mass spectrometry actually is, again, the most sensitive. I'm just running through this analytical technique because then maybe there will be some other more, uh, let's say, interesting topic. This is an ion chromatography where we can see the nitrate ion. And uh, this is one nanogram per mil uh, of nitrate. And we see also the chlorine ion. Uh, why I'm showing this, uh, when you have a lot of chlorine in your sample, the chlorine can actually overlap the nitrate. And this is actually the problem of this technique. Uh, let's say about the two derivatization technique which are mostly used. There are many others also, but uh, let's uh, focus on these two, which are actually very often mentioned in the literature. The first one is using diamino naphthalene, uh, which actually reacts at the pH between one and two with nitrate. And then you can uh, produce uh, naphtoltriazole, which is uh, fluorescence and it's very, you can very sensitively detect it. The other uh, derivatization reaction is grease uh, reagent, a very uh, old known uh, way to uh, react with nitrate. Again, the reaction goes on uh, at low pH and uh, it can have, uh, in the product is also uh, azodi, uh, which has an uh, UV absorption at uh, 495, or even invisible at 540 nanometers. Here are just two uh, chromatograms where uh, we uh, analyzed uh, 10 to the minus fifth milligram per milliliter of nitrate. Uh, the upstairs, you see the nut is actually the peak for nitrate. The, the down is the, the reagent. And uh, below is the grease uh, reaction. And you can easily see that uh, we can go easily do, uh, lower here down to 10 to the minus seventh uh, quite nicely. But what is interesting, uh, here in the top chromatogram, you see the analysis of a blank. And actually, this blank is not really blank because of the position of a nitrate, which you can see on the chromatogram below. We have a nice peak. So uh, this is actually a contamination. This is a low level contamination, which we have uh, actually, uh, we were able to reach in our lab uh, because we found out that you can find nitrate at PPB levels on, in different chemicals, in plastic, in filters, and even in glassware. So uh, our experience here is that uh, it's not so important to have a most sensitive analytical technique because actually the background or the contamination of the system with nitrate will actually uh, drive your sensitivity. Uh, so after using this uh, nice technique, uh, let's talk about 
uh, the levels of uh, nitrite in different excipients. So uh, here are the, the two classes, uh, not all, but let's say just to have a, a taste of it. Uh, you can see here on the left side sugars and silica gel, which are from the family of low level uh, nitrite by itself. These are not uh, uh, excipients which were, uh, let's say, uh, produced in means of having low nitrite. These are normal, normal excipients where we see uh, nitrite from 28 up to 100 ppb, so quite low level. Uh, the positive story is uh, the ones on the right side, magnesium sterate, calcium carbonate, magnesium oxide, cosporidone, uh, and also sodium across uh, methyl cellulose. You see we are going up uh, to PPM level of nitrite in these excipients. Uh, in brackets, you see the figure. This is an average of three different uh, batches. So the levels here are quite high. Uh, my hypothesis is that actually uh, it, it has to do something with the basicity of this excipient. Uh, so uh, to have another, let's say, uh, uh, taste of the levels, these are excipients which uh, we took from the shelf. No, these are not fresh, fresh excipients. So these are just the figures to, to see uh, where we can go from low level uh, for, for example, for this HPMC uh, up to 1 ppm for ethyl cellulose uh, and everything in between. So uh, quite, quite high levels anyway in, in excipients. And this is another uh, quite interesting uh, uh, comparison. Uh, we have different batches of magnesium stearate, PVP and MCC and we can see uh, quite different levels of nitrite in these excipients. So uh, from uh, just uh, 60 ppb up to one, one, two or four ppm. So uh, a huge spread of levels of nitrite. So you have to be quite careful uh, what you take. So not each, each batch is equal to the other. But maybe now we are approaching the, let's say, a bit more interesting topic. And uh, this is maybe uh, something new for many people. Uh, so on the left side, we have a graph where we were measuring uh, nitrogen oxides in our lab. Uh, so nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen oxide. In this case, you can see in, in these six hours, the level of nitrogen oxide was about 20 ppb. And we took lactose and starch, which had low level of nitrite, so below uh, detection limit here. And we exposed it in the same uh, room uh, to the uh, open dish to the air. And you see the starch build up uh, the nitrite level up to 320. So a quite, quite high, uh, let's say, build up of nitrite. Then we, we took uh, another experiment uh, for four hours. Again, the levels of nitrogen oxide were, uh, dioxide were a bit higher. Uh, we, we took colidon and povidon. These two at the beginning were not, uh, let's say, so low about nitrite, but they build up quite some, some nitrite af just after four hours. And again, Another case, we checked different batches of lactose, we checked across carmelose, and we checked different batches of starch, and we exposed them for 24 hours. Uh, very interesting, you can see how actually the level of nitrogen oxide went up in, in one period of the day. And interestingly, lactose actually does not uh, gain anything in, in the nitrite. Cross cameras uh, gain just 138, but the starch, depending on the batch, gained different levels of nitrite. So this is something which is, I think, very important uh, when you are actually buying your excipient and you, 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 you think your excipient has a low level of nitrite, but if you expose it to air, maybe this low level will not stay there. Uh, so, for this reason, I'm showing here an example of metformin tablet. 
Uh, this is a high dose uh, tablet, just 5% of, uh, of the excipient in the tablet. Uh, the metformin is a hydrochloride uh, salt. So we, we, we have this typical steps with granulation, uh, mixing with magnesium stearate, tableting, and then at the end uh, coating the tablet. Uh, this is a uh, wet uh, coating uh, and it, it's performed in a, a regular uh, batch, uh, high volume batch. So the air uh, which is applied is something about 3000 cubic meter per hour. This uh, operation can take many hours and uh, the temperature can go even up to uh, 80 degrees. And what we have done. So uh, we, we measured uh, the contribution of the API and the excipients, and we, we summed them in something about 100 ppb of nitrite can be at the beginning. And this is actually what we found in the uncoated tablet. But then you can see after the coating of the tablet, so after blowing huge quantities of air over the tablet, we see a dramatic rise of nitrate in, into the tablet. And uh, these are different batches. There are all, all these batches are all uh, industrial scale. And in all cases, nearly 10, 10 times rise of the nitrate in the product. And anyway, these levels of nitrate in the product, it's actually can, can damage, can, can contribute to the formation of uh, nitrosamines. So for at the end, let's recapitulate. Uh, we have to be able to determine nitrate at PPB level, mainly if we want to uh, check the level of introducing with the excipients. Uh, there can be many different techniques which can be used, but there's some quite uh, easy to be used. Uh, be aware about the, the uh, glassware and the plastic you're using because uh, at the PPB level you can find nitrate uh, in many chemicals and plastic. Very important message here uh, from uh, our lab is that nitrogen oxide from the air can actually contribute to rise the nitrate in your excipients. And uh, so do not store excipients open dish. And of course, very important uh, in some cases, I'm not saying that in all cases, but in this case with a metformin tablet, uh, we saw a dramatic rise of nitrate during the tablet coating. And at the end, I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, Simona, Sandra, Eva, and Pia, who have done this uh, nice work. And thank you. So I guess we're going to have our, our panel discussion, you know, um, so I would like to invite all the speaker and then panelists to, to the front. Okay, sure. Sure. Okay, so just to start off, I, I I already introduced speakers, but I want to introduce some of these panelists that are not that are not that were not speakers. So the first one I want to introduce is Bangwa Yonoregi. Know, He's a division director in biopharmaceutics in the Office of, of New Drugs. Okay. And his division is responsible for the assessment of clinically relevant in vitro release specifications for drug products, in vitro and vivo correlations, physiologically based pharmaceutical based modeling, scientific bridging studies, bio waivers, and BCS classification requests. He's a member of the FDA Emerging Technology Team, ICH 
Q12 expert implementation working group, and has served as a FDA liaison at, at the USP expert committee. And he has received his BS in MS in pharmacy from the University of Mumbai in India, and a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from the University of Maryland in Baltimore. Um, I also want to introduce um, Lucy, Lucy Fang, she, she's the deputy director in the division of quantitative modeling, you know, in the Office of Research and Standards, in the Office of Generic Drugs. And she, um, um, so she, since her joining the OGD in 2004, she has held several responsibilities, including team lead in quantitative clinical pharmacology team, associate director and deputy director within the, you know, mo mo modeling team. She has established herself as an XDA expert in the use of quantitative, quantitative clinical pharmacology approaches in the review and regulation of generic drugs. Um, she obtained her PhD from pharmaceutical sciences from the Ohio State University and is a graduate of the Excellence in Government Fellows Program. Um, and also I would like to introduce, you know, we have some panelists online. Um, we have Moonro Jarrod, and she's the, um, from USP. She's the vice president of R&D USP India. So um, she has over 27 years of pharmaceutical experience and is overseeing the compendio development at the um, laboratories and analytical research development in USP India. And her main responsibilities are to develop and validate analytical methods um, for you know, book material impurities of APIs and characterize them to the support the development in documentary standards, such as monographs for drug substances, drug products, excipients, and foods. And um, she's actually, and she's leading the nitrosamine work streams globally within USP, which is responsible for formulating the nit focus nitrosamine strategy for USP. I would also like to introduce um, Zdenko Cesar. He's the um, he received his PhD in organic chemistry from the University of Rene, France, and he has 19 years of experience in the generic industry, and his experience spans product pre-development phase to scale up, to in, in, um, as well as um, working complex generic products. His main areas of research are in development work linked to the synthesis of active pharmaceutical ingredients, drug analytics, and drug st stability. Currently, um, he is at Sandoz and is head of early development and in Sandoz development in, um, in Slovenia, and he's a full professor of medicinal chemistry and faculty of pharmacy um, in Slovenia. So I think with that, I think I have all, all the panelists, I hope, yeah. So, you know, we're, so I guess we'll have the, the, the Q&A. And so we have, so what I'm going to start off, I'm going to have, we have some questions that, that we, we wanted to, to run, you know, th through the panelists. And after that, I'm going to take, you know, questions from, from the audience here. And then if there's time, we'll take, you know, questions, you know, that are coming from the remote, the remote audience. Okay. So the first, the first question we have is, and, and this is a little bit, this, you know, this is directed to Justin, but other people can, you know, come in is, can you provide some ins and this has actually became quite relevant as, as I saw a lot of the presentations, but can you provide some insights into how to develop, you know, to, to Justin, can you provide some insights in how to develop some, des to best design a model, I mean, study to help inform the solid state drug product risk, risk assessment? Can you provide some insights yeah. into that? Yeah, sure. No, I, I um, certainly just tried to touch the surface of that in my talk, but, you know, and I tried to outline during the talk that, you know, first, really it's, you're only doing it to inform your, your risk assessments on your drug products. So the first thing you gotta really do is, in my opinion, you, you study what those drug product constraints are, the formulation components. We heard some really interesting insight about how like a nitride impurity can vary significantly between types of excipients as well as lot to lot or supplier to supplier. So looking at that, what kind of variation do you expect? That might frame the types of uh, nitrite conditions you want to study in a model amine study, for example. Then, you know, your source of amine, your properties of those amines. Um, you know, I tried to share some data showing how like conversion of a, a amine from a crystalline state uh, to an amorphous state can really enhance its reactivity. And we saw that with some of our data. Um, and, and, and also, 
in, in Martin's talk, right, about how the, the impurities and, the, and where it's captured in the structure of that amine can, can be relevant. I think that also probably alludes to what we saw in some of the amorphization of the amine. So in, in essence, when you're looking at a drug product, what types of these factors could be present? Oh, sure. Is, is that better? Oh, yeah, perfect. I can hear myself. <laughs> um, and then, you know, so it, whether the physical form is relevant, whether the nitrate, you know, what kind of nitrate concentration is relevant, then, you know, trying to find an amine that's going to have properties that are relevant to that drug product. And also, I, I might have alluded to, given the paucity of data, and I would argue that still exists, right, <laughs> until the scientific literature becomes a lot more populated, we tried to pick conditions that were conservative. Right. So when we study the, the, uh, this model system, because at the end of the day, you're trying to use data from a model system to inform a real drug product. If you have a, a conservative basis and constraints in your system, that way the data, if, if you're seeing a very limited formation of nitrosamines, you feel confident in leveraging that information to apply to an actual drug product risk assessment. Um, and then certainly, I think we saw some great examples today. When you're carrying out your studies, you need to be very careful in your analytical techniques in the lab, right? Uh, filter contamination was mentioned in the last talk. That, that, that got us, right? In the early uh, days of characterizing our excipients, we saw very high levels of nitrite, which were blowing our minds. How could this much be here? Well, we found out in the lab, we were contaminating it with filters and we switched to centrifugation, right? These type of careful techniques when you're framing out the study design are very important. And then the process, right? How, so if you have a product that's wet granulation, um, obviously choosing a wet granulation approach would be relevant. Studying the drying. Um, it's really nice to, uh, information that Roke was talking about, about looking at uh, the nitrosamine contam um, formation during the drying step can inform not only maybe uh, how the extent could be relevant to your process control strategy, but also could allude to the mechanism. If, if the nitrite and or amine is enriching in a certain uh, uh, portion of within your solid drug product, that could be increasing the reactivity state because obviously it's concentration driven. So kind of thinking through the risk factors and designing your sampling strategy and your characterization strategy appropriately, and then carrying out that um, uh, study, you know, through appropriate stress conditions that are relevant to your product and also maybe exceeding that. We saw a lot of use of very aggressive conditions today to really try to hit it with a hammer and see if anything forms. I think that can lead to a, a data set that can be transmitted directly to product risk assessments in a usable manner. Okay. No, thank you. And, and, you know, and I alluded to this and I'm, and I, you know, I wanted to, this is another question I think is very important is about differentiating. And I really, I want also Martin to talk about this because I think you, it's about differentiating between crystalline versus amorphous. So, you know, you know, what happens in solution very different is what happens solid, solid state. Can you both comment upon the risk factors? I mean, how much higher risk is an amorphous form versus a crystal, you know, crystalline forms in terms of forming these NDSRIs, you know, are they much higher risk? Maybe you both can comment upon that because I think you did so go ahead. You want to go first? Mike? Sure, sure. I can I can cover that. Well, when it comes to uh, amorphous uh, amorphous APIs, for example, I would break that into two categories. There's uh, amorphotization, which is deliberate in the drug product process. One is intending to amorphotize the the API that might have been crystalline as an input material, versus cases where an amorphous API itself is used directly in the formulation. First, uh, not specifying the particular API. Just in general, I would I would expect that if the uh, NDSRI of concern is from an impurity in the API and not the API itself, that the uh, amorphous version of that API versus crystalline on average will be a higher risk for some fairly obvious reasons. One is uh, that in general, the actual surface area of amorphous products tends to be higher for a given nominal particle size distribution more available surface, some of that impurities distributed at the surface, you could have higher on a per weight basis, higher levels of reaction. Um, and that would be in the case where I'm saying where, where the, uh, the amorphous nature of the API, uh, or the API itself is amorphous going into the drug product. Um, that could be, that you could only imagine could be further exacerbated if you're amorphotizing a previously crystalline API in the drug product itself, drug product process itself. Uh, you're distributing probably to what are effectively 
uh, smaller particle sizes, thinner layers, if you will, zones of, of the amorphous API distributed throughout the drug product. Again, I think that's going to increase, uh, increase reactivity um, of vulnerable means that are in the API. I don't know, Justin, if you have more to add. No, I, I think you summarized it pretty well. I, I would just try to, to uh, let, just like to add to the, the processing element. So in, in the study, I, I showed that the example of the direct compression blend where it was crystalline after processing, but it was actually only after stressing it to elevate humidities that we saw that it lost its crystallinity and presumably was fairly amorphous and that led to higher formation. So exactly what's happening in the solid matrix that led to that, we never investigated that level of detail. But the other thing that's in the paper is uh, we used the, the same amine and wet granulation formulation and saw that it, the crystallinity was also obliterated during manufacturing and we saw significantly higher levels of formation across all of our stability conditions uh, in that case in, in indicative that whatever that loss of physical form stability of that neat material during processing seems to have led to higher formation um, upon further digging uh, digging into that problem a little further we found that this amine that we chose had quite a high solubility and in fact the solubility was about threefold higher than if you if you look at your wet granulator and put it as a control volume and calculate for the amount of water going in versus the amount of API and assume that all of it would dissolve. So you look at that as a concentration of API in the water that's in the granulator. That was one third of the solubility. So now you start to think, well, we didn't measure it, but effectively we could have dissolved that amine quite effectively during the processing and then just distributed it at a very high uh, state of mic micro mixing throughout of our, our tablet formulation, giving very, very good contact with the nitrite that was in the excipients leading to the pretty high levels we thought we saw on that work. Given some of the amine properties like the higher PKA uh, that was present, we wouldn't have expected maybe to see so much, but that, that high level of potential mixedness in that tablet could have led to more reactivity. So that's something to consider too, if you have an amorphous situation. Okay, thank you very much. And so I'm going to switch from API because, you know, I think we talked about some of the API factors, but I want to go now switch a little bit to the excipient factors. And I think there were some really, you know, you know, good talks and on this. And I'm going to direct questions to this to, you know, Dr. Sander Vangesso and also to some extent, Rock Grahek, because he also provided uh, a very nice presentation, some of these excipient questions. But other people can, you know, inter, uh, you know feel, feel, feel free to pitch in. But one thing that um, it's related also to this, um, related a little bit to the morphous thing we we're talking about, but are all nitrites present in excipients equally available to react? You know, so you know you could have nitrites, but are they all, you know, equally available? I think that's a very important thing to discuss. Yeah, good question, and I think uh, I think it relates very well also to what uh, what Martin was showing that you know there is is that potential that you have um, nitrites when we when we're measuring nitrites we're also measuring them in solution right so you're capturing the entire amount and in the talk that I was uh, showing we're also taking that worst case situation in which we are you know uh, um, taking the full amount of nitrites that we are measuring as being accessible for nitrization. Um, Though, though I don't know of any study with with a lot of uh, cases, you will have, of course, that the surface the surface nitrite that's then available is um, uh, is is going to be critical for that uh, nitrization uh, nitrization, and might be very interesting to do the slip testing that you were doing on uh, on uh, on excipients and see how that relates to uh, to the nitrites that are available. And also go a little bit on, I think, yeah, that's a very good point. And then I think the other point I also wanted to, to ask was, we, we, did, we did notice that, you know, amongst ex excipient suppliers, we had, you know, dramatically different, different levels. And, you know, I was just, and, you know, I was just wondering if you could comment upon that and, and you know, why, why do you think that would be the case? Well, we've in in our investigations, we've been we've been looking at let's say the root cause of nitrites um, in 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 our excipients, and uh, the uh, investigations we focused mainly on was uh, was on uh, our MCC process, for example, and uh, also as part of the 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 IPEC risk uh, risk impacts, you're looking at the different inputs, right? So you're looking at uh, the raw material that you're using, what's uh, what's um, uh, the the nitrosamine or the nitrite level 
that is coming from there. What are the uh, process inputs? So um, water, uh, air, what is the levels there? And what we definitely see, and well, that's kind of comparable to what Rock was seeing, is that in the different stages, we see slight buildups. Um, uh, and, but what, where we really saw it build up was within, uh, within the drying stage. So uh, within the drying stage, uh, when you're, 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 you're typically going through a wet process at a certain point, and then you bring it to a dry powder, and uh, that stage is where um, the nitrites come into the, the excipient for the most part. Um, we'd have to repeat that study, I think, because our, our level of scrutiny or our level of detection is increasing and increasing with our testing. It would be really interesting to see how that uh, then looks like. Um, if you'd look at the differences between different manufacturers, also the, the type of drying or the use of the type of air is quite critical. So um, uh, if, you, if you have a directly, directly um, heated air, then at the moment where the, the heat comes in, top, in, in contact with the, um, the heating element, that's where a lot of the uh, nitrization from the air occurs. And if this air then uh, it comes into contact with the excipient, then you have an elevated level of nitrite versus, for example, indirectly heated, heated air, which then uh, does not have that direct association. So this is, these, are, these are kind of the elements that have an impact on the levels of nitrites within the different excipients. It's, it's not the only one because, uh, of course, different excipients have different, different processing routes. But for MCC, which we studied in detail, this was, uh, this was definitely uh, where, we, uh, where we found the most significant impact. Thank you. I think, Rock, Rock he has, you have your hand, your hand raised, so you want to make a comment? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, actually, my video doesn't start and still not working for that. Uh, sorry for not showing me. Anyway, uh, maybe just few few answers here. Uh, uh, when we were talking uh, where the nitrite sits, you know, uh, so we know that we, we uh, take some nitrite in, in, in our product with the API. So this is actually on the right position when we are talking about the, the vulnerable mine. And the other comes with the excipients. And what we have done in one case, we were measuring uh, the rise of nitrosamine and the drop of nitrite. And we saw that actually the drop of nitrite goes down uh, even lower than the sum of the nitrite in the coplet tablet. So it looks like that in this case, I'm not telling that this is the case for each uh, example, but in this case, it doesn't really matter from where the nitrite comes. It looks like the nitrite is uh, moving around and con come, come into the contact with the uh, secondary amine and react. So uh, I think that, uh, that uh, actually the uh, uh, nitrite acid Nitric acid is actually moving around the system. So this is something what is uh, uh, one hypothesis. Uh, even though uh, there are some, let's say, uh, sites where it can be built up as a salt, as I showed before with those excipients, which, which are a, a, a kind of uh, more basic. Uh, regarding the levels of nitrites in excipients, of course, some are bidding quite high, quite high levels, and they they those are uh, we showed that those are quite damaging. When you have excipients uh, with a PPM level, uh, you will never reach or very difficult uh, it's to reach uh, low levels of nitrosamines. Okay, th thank you, thank you. So, so I'm going to sort of change a little bit. I'm going to go to these anti antioxidants. I'm going to direct the questions a little bit to you know, on Dia and also to, to Marco as well. Okay, so so I guess, you know, it was very interesting that the presentations, you sort of like slightly different perspectives, you know, and the results were different, different. but I guess the question to you both is, do you think that antioxidants are, are an effective strategy to mitigate NDSR information for nitrosamines? I know we had slightly different results, but I just wanted to see your, 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 your both of your thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you. Great question. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we we induced actually, uh, uh, as as I mentioned, we have uh, spiked uh, very high amount of nitrite into the system just to to test if the antioxidants are really effective uh, at certain concentration. And as I mentioned, we use three different concentrations. We exaggerated by uh, uh, spiking that high concentration just to make sure uh, the system is, is, is working. And uh, yes, uh, we saw that 1%, it really mitigate uh, this antioxidant and especially the ascorbic acid. Uh, I'm sure it's related to solubility. Um, uh, we don't know why ascorbic acid worked well compared to caffeic acid and uh, ferulic acid, but we saw almost 90% of this uh, exaggerated amount of NDSRI formed. It was uh, mitigated at, at, uh, at that condition, at, at temperature, different temperature and uh, humidity. So, Marco. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. No, in general, I agree that, yeah, antioxidants are an effective strategy, um, but of course, yeah, it's not really, uh, there's no general solution here. So, I guess, yeah, it depends on the antioxidant, on the API, on the on the whole formulation, really on so many different factors. Um, so um, maybe one thing to point out also is, of course, we mostly discussed, um, let's say, nitrizations via, via this, um, let's say, nitri as nitrite being the main culprit. Uh, there are certain, let's say, more exotic, yet still um, possible pathways where nitrosamines can form via different other, let's say, reactive ox um, oxygen species. And of course, even here, antioxidants might provide also some additional uh, protection, um, I know, via some peroxides. Um, and this is also something that, that is present in excipients, um, which is even, let's say, more known that, uh, that for nitrites. So I think, yeah, they do offer, let's say, a, a good possibility. But of course, yeah, it's not the only solution. And it's not a solution yeah, for every system. Yeah, go ahead, Bangwa. Yeah, I think the mitigation strategies will need to be product specific, because as uh, many of the speakers have shown that uh, these secondary amine mean, compounds have different susceptibilities, and then these uh, antioxidants or pH modifiers also can have different efficacy, sort of, uh, in uh, in terms of mitigation. So, in some cases, you can get away with just choosing excipients with low nitrite levels and dry processing, but then these experiments may not be available to all of the generic manufacturers, you might be really limiting yourself. So in which case you may want to go to reformulation with some of this and control uh, nitrosamine in your product. But then you have to think about manufacturing process. We heard that uh, dry processes might be safer, but if you're incorporating antioxidants or pH modifiers at one to 2%, uh, it is dry processing going to be the most effective way to incorporate that? So you may actually have to go to wet processing and then the, you have competing uh, factors here where uh, wet processing and uh, drying could actually promote uh, NDSRI formation versus incorporation of those antioxidants might be mitigating factors. So additional research will need to be done or, or you can maybe pre-process some of your fillers or some of those components with with processing and then dry it out and then use as dry component, but it could introduce additional complications of compactability because the more wet steps you add, so uh, you can create another problem. So additional research needs to be done, definitely. Yeah, no, no, I think, you know, no, I, this, that makes total sense. So I'm, I'm going to ask this question to, um, to Lucy Fong because, you know, you know, she does a lot of modeling and simulation. And you think you know some of those modeling simulation tools that that you that you typically use you know for PBPK? Do you think they could be applied also to this nit nitrosamine problem for the formulation? Yeah, thank you. So I, I really want to thank our industry colleagues for uh, developing those kinetic models to predict risk of nitrosamine formation. And I, I particularly like the approach you guys are taking using. Uh, like from Justin's talk, you mentioned that you guys are taking the most conservative approach, the assumption to over predict natural some information for risk assessment aspect. I really appreciate all those efforts. And I mean, in, in your talk, Justin, you mentioned there a lot of factors contribute to the formation of the natural summing. I mean, you, you gave a number like 40 different factors. I mean, uh, hearing that, I really 
I mean, I think that open the opportunity for some machine learning or artificial intelligence approach that that can really be applied to optimize the different manufacturing process. I, I really look forward to some that type of modeling as well. So thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna, you know, show, focus a little bit to to the testing, and I'm gonna bring a lot of people. So the first from from, you know, from Jingu Yang, can you talk about have you know, what have you? I guess the question is, what are some issues and challenges associated with the analytical method um, analysis of NDSRIs that that you have found? And you said, and 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 the other thing also to think about. You know the study results that you that you have done for small molecule nitrosamines. How can these findings be applied to NDSRIs? Oh, um, the study that I presented today that we did that with a small molecule nitrosamine. So now when we scope move more towards like NDSRI, we see like a larger or bigger nitrosamines. But uh, in general, we believe that uh, the kind of same like uh, uh, study findings can also be applied to the NDSRI. And also, as a uh, discussion, this briefly discussed in the talk that uh, according to our experience, that uh, actually the instrument analysis part of the NDSRI performance looks like better than the small molecule, quite likely because of the large size, more available ionization sites to allow the different type of the uh, quantitation detection approach. Yeah, yeah. It, no, no, thank you. And then also since we have, since we have the, our USB colleague Monroe John right on, on, you know, on online, um, I, I guess, you know, and USB monographs have to have test methods for, you know, nitrosamines. I think, can you comment upon how, you know, USP could, could um, you know, you know, could um, contribute to solutions in, in relation to, you know, testing for these products and, and so forth. Uh, yeah, hello. So thanks, Andre. So uh, USP uh, being a standard setting organization uh, you know, does not necessarily have access to information that could be used to directly um, you know, assist manufacturers. But at USP Labs, we are working on developing methods for uh, determination of nitrites in excipients, at-risk excipients. So we have identified list of at-risk uh, at excipients and then we are developing methods. Um, so we are also facing a lot of challenges with respect to solubility, matrix interferences, um, and uh, also detection uh, related issues, but we are trying to develop very specific, sensitive and robust method. And this methods uh, could be published um, uh, as additional procedures in our analytical hub, which is housed in nitrosamine exchange, though uh, it may not become an official standard, uh, but it uh, can still be made available to our uh, stakeholders uh, to um, refer and uh, uh, follow the methods as their starting point. So this is one, um, you know, a specific uh, 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 strategy which USP is uh, currently adopting by developing methods uh, to help our uh, stakeholders. And we are also synthesizing um, nitrosamine drug substance related impurities in our uh, in house synthetic labs. And these impurities are um, you know, currently uh, available as reference materials under our new initiative pharmaceutical analytical impurities. Uh, these can be used by manufacturers to. Uh, develop methods and also test their products. Uh, at the same time, if they want to use these NDSRI reference materials for conducting any toxicity studies, uh, because these are well characterized uh, reference materials, these can also be used. So apart from method, this is another opportunity uh, through which we are trying to help our stakeholders. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, thank you. I think I was audible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Say Go ahead. Go Can ahead. I just add one thing to that? Just and for those who aren't aware, there's a really nice paper that just came out through the IQ consortia on sc schemes on making your own standards for NDR, uh, NDSRIs. So I just for anyone that's interested, you know, look up that paper. I think it's uh, really, really good work specifically for NDSRIs. Okay. And and going and going a little bit to the testing, you know, I'm gonna you know, I want 
Zdenko Cesar to, to, to comment and, and also, you know, USP colleague and, and, and Martin, you know, this is about the, this is sort of the other quagmire we have. We know that secondary mean are susceptible, but you know, that if the API is there, but what happens, what do we do with these secondary mean impurities? Like you have a, you have a, I mean, you have an API, it's not a secondary, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's an AMID, it's there's no secondary mean, but has, it's going to have these residual secondary mean impurities. And, and so I guess the question is, you know, what, you know, what, what is the, the risk of those, of those levels, like around the ICH, Q3A, Q3B levels to, you know, what is the risk of them forming, you know, um, you know, realistic risk. I mean, the present down, the present at a thousand times less, you know, usually, what's the real, realistic risk of them forming NDSRIs at these very high levels? And, and, and if so, you know, what, you know, what do you think about updating specifications for, for secondary amino impurities in, 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 in APIs in general? So those are, that's a pretty loaded question. So I'm going to have um, Zdenko Cesar comment, um, you know, or USB colleague Colin, as well as, as Martin, you know, and anyone else as they see fit. Uh, you said, so you, you I, want to start? Go ahead, says you want to start? Okay, go ahead, go around one round, go ahead. Yeah, is this related to uh, limits for NDSRIs in monographs? Is this the question related to No, 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 this is related to, so this is related to the question is, we know that secondary mean drugs are susceptible, but what, hap what about, but, but the thing that the quagmire that we're facing is we have a lot of drugs that are not secondary means, but the problem is they could have a lot of residual secondary mean impurities like around 0.1%, 0.2% based upon ICH levels. And those impurities in turn could in the drug product manufacturing turn into NDSRIs. So I think the question is, um, you know, what, you know, how is USP thinking about it, you know, about this question? And so that, that, that'll be, I guess, since you're, so I, that'll, that'll be the question to USP. So what do you think about these um, standards for, you know, monograph standards for these residual secondary means, which we know could theoretically form NDSRIs and drug products? So how is USP thinking about that problem? Yeah, so this is a very good question. And at present, uh, uh, frankly speaking, we do not have a you know, straightforward answer, uh, but yes, we, USP, um, you know, uh, can, um, if sponsors are ready to share the information about the methods and limits that are approved by FDA, then USP can up update those mon monographs and incorporate those revised specifications for uh, those uh, secondary I mean, impurities which are present um, in APIs. Uh, but as of now, uh, to answer your questions, um, you know, we haven't updated any such monographs, but the discussions are in progress. And once we um, arrive at uh, any decisions, uh, then probably we would be in a better position to respond to this question. Uh, but yes, this is being considered and under discussion with expert committee members. Thank you. And, and go ahead, you know, go, go ahead, Cesar, you know, go ahead. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi, thank you very much for, for pointing out my question. Uh, I would just maybe to put a little bit more light on it. So where the problem lies exactly is that at the moment, um, final drug product manufacturers are facing really a huge challenge because API manufacturers are claiming that their API is suitable and fully fulfills the requirements of the monographs. But as we heard today in many of the talks, you put such an API in the formulation and your uh, NDSRI will be formed in the formulation. At the end, you produce unsuitable product, final product from suitable API. So the current situation of, of uh, medicines producer is quite tough. And uh, yeah, it would be really good that uh, the whole community thinks about these monographs and, and we do certain action as soon as possible in the right direction. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and the question to Martin, you know, you were talking about your you know, slab method to, to address this, you know, so I want you to answer that question. I have one more question to, to all that just came to mind. Go ahead. Sure, okay, thanks. Yeah, I appreciate the comments uh, from Zdenko and, and Monral. Uh, um, I think 
I agree. I feel sympathy for Denko's comment that the API manufacturer will say, our product meets all requirements. It's suitable for use in your drug product. It's, I'm talking specifically about the secondary amine precursors that can form NDSRIs. That's uh, certainly something I've heard many times myself too. Uh, um, and I think partly that comes, and then I'll get around to the actual risk from these. Uh, partly that comes from uh, the guidances, FDA's guidance, EMA's, Health Canada, et cetera, are putting all the onus on the drug product manufacturer and the API manufacturer is somewhat peripheral. There's no direct, uh, no direct requirement from the API manufacturer themselves to help, uh, you know, help in the control strategies for, uh, for NDSRIs in drug products. So from a policy direction, thinking about that and spreading the, the ownership for that around more uh, might be beneficial. Um, okay, that's more a policy position. Now, in terms of risk, uh, I would say on average, if the only NDSR ri risks you have in a given drug product stem from impurity precursor amines and not from the API itself, generally there will be less risk of having higher levels of NDSRIs. It's not the same as saying you won't detect them, but as we settle in in this afternoon sessions, trying to address some of this, as we settle into acceptable intakes, um, uh, you know, they may be present, but they may not be present at problematic levels. So that's something to be optimistic about. Um, in terms of the question, and I raised it myself in my presentation, will secondary amine impurities in non-vulnerable uh, drug substances require tighter limits? I think it would be appropriate to deal with that case by case right now and not necessarily move to, for example, a revision of Q, uh, ICHQ3A to say, oh, they all, you know, they all go from, just to make it up, point, point 0.15 for qualified impurities to point zero 0.015, just like that. I, I don't think the industry needs that. I don't think it's the uh, appropriate response. Uh, to the point of, that I was giving, not a, th um, a thousand PPMs of a secondary amine in API A from supplier A is not necessarily as much of a problem as a thousand ppm of that same impurity from in API A from supplier B. Sorry for using the same letters all the time. Um, if you get what I mean, we have to understand how it's distributed in the product and how available it is to reaction. And, and so having these companion techniques to differentiate that may allow us to live in a world where, no, we don't really have to crank down Q3A limits just across the board for secondary mean impurities. You know, those are, those are my thoughts on it. Okay, thank you, thank you. So I think this is a very good discussion. So now um, I wanna start opening it. Does anyone in, in here in this room have any questions? Feel free to come to the mic. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, it was very interesting to hear this for somebody who worked on nitrosamines for 13 years under, you know, Lepke and Lijinsky. Uh, some of these are known. I worked on nitric oxide under Larry Kiefer, and I have told this to Martin, I think, in 2019, that in one experiment I worked on cosmetics, I exposed cosmetics. Uh, I was looking for Nadella, of course, nitrosotriadiethanolamine to very small amount of nitric oxide in a closed, you know, uh, aerobic environment. And I saw significant rise in, you know, the levels of Nadella. This was 1987. I was, I was born very young, so <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't make a guess on my age on that. Uh, regarding the nitros, you know, the scavengers, Dr. Lepke always used to say that he had a lot of connection and NCI could get grants very easily on locking nitrosation. He never tried that because there is no silver bullet. You, it's so difficult to do one thing, to do the blocking. But uh, I wanted to come to a state uh, question based on that because in my heart, I do believe that at the at the end of the day, I think we have to scavenge. Uh, you know, scavengers uh, may not be the only solution, but will be a big solution. Uh, you talked about caffeic acid, ferulic acid. You talked about uh, you know one size not fitting all. There will be 
uh, you know, reagents, which probably have a lot of safety information in the public domain, but they're not in IIG. And my request will be at one point for FDA to start thinking. I know it's very difficult, but when it comes to nitrosamine, to think, for example, fake acid didn't work in yours, but there are many where it works that, you know, based on the publicly available information, maybe you let certain amount of those to be in the formulation. So uh, my request is, I think that while not the only solution, this is going to be a big part of the solution. And uh, one big challenge is the IIG and probably you may have to, you know, FDA may have to actively think about that. And uh, it's more a comment, but probably food for thought too. Um, I hear a lot that there are there are lots of issues with excipients, and we had wonderful presentations about excipients in the early portion. Um, but the companies are very multinational. There are Indian manufacturers by excipients in India. There are some U.S. by excipients in U.S. Is there something we could do towards standardization of excipient quality? Is there a Clearly, there are some different different makers do a uh, different degree of the job controlling. Um, but is there something we could change in the specifications to improve the um, overall purity and the outcome for the drugs? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Of course, it's quite an international uh, field of suppliers for the, of excipients. Uh, they're produced in very many places in the world. Uh, we manufacture ours in Europe, uh, in, uh, in in New Zealand and in India. Uh, for one, that's just one supplier, right? So, um, and I, at the end of the day, I don't think it necessarily has to do with where it's uh, manufactured, but yeah, how. And um, then looking at, looking at, on the one hand, um, also the, the the motto of the FDA is you know build quality into your product, right? So uh, understanding where it comes from and building building that in there, and not testing necessarily into compliance, but then you know using it as a control mechanism. Um, going to the the point of of um, specifications, I mean I think we we all have to take a bit of a step step by step approach. Uh, we're, we're very much learning as we're going, just as the entire industry is. Um, the, the, initially, we, um, uh, we were looking at nitrite levels and we were all looking at what kind of uh, levels of detection, levels of quantifications do we need to be relevant uh, within the discussion. And we kept on, we started, at, uh, um, we started at 1 ppm, we went down to 0.1 ppm. Now we're at uh, uh, 50 ppb, sometimes 30 ppb, right? So um, it, it puts a lot of pressure on, on understanding what test method is then needed. How do you make that robust? Um, how do you ensure stability? Uh, going to uh, ro rocks paper of you know uh, uh, um, some excipients being relatively stable over time whilst others are less stable over time. So all these different factors need to be taken into account before we actually start setting specifications, I believe. Um, and it's about you know, you know, keeping that dialogue open within the industry so we all understand where, uh, where, we, where we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question. Uh, it, it goes back to the uh, conversation on antioxidants, and I was just kind of curious. Um, in your studies, are those antioxidants were, were they added into the API as a dry blend, or did you do some type of recrystallization? And then, if you did the latter with the recrystallization, did you do any studies on co-crystals and the and the crystallinity? And what, and what type of studies did you do there? I'm just curious. Yeah, so, so the study that we did, uh, uh, we added the antioxidant as a dry blend in the beginning. But the, the way how we mixed it, it's the geometric mixing that makes sure that it's distributed well between within the API. Because uh, the number of studies that we did, if we don't mix 
the antioxidant well with the API initially, you don't get the result that you're looking for. So uh, uh, yeah, definitely we, we mixed it in the, in the drive state in the beginning with the API. So uh, I don't know uh, if you have. Yeah, that. our approach was a bit different. So we added the antioxidant um, as a solution. I think it was like a 50, 50% of water ethanol. So in order yeah, to completely dissolve the, the antioxidant or the scavenger, uh, and then, yeah, we pretty much mixed it yeah, with, uh, with the blends of API and all the other excipients. So it was somewhat of a wet granulation, you would say. Uh, so we didn't really, let's say, monitor or um, did any, um, any experiments on the, on the actual solid state um, of, the, of the API. But yeah, the idea was yeah, to get as much of a homogeneous um, distribution of the, of the scavenger throughout the whole formulation. Um, definitely, I mean, what I think is that it's not maybe what's more important is actually that the, let's say the contact or the, the distribution of the scavenger uh, is really good in relation to the nitrite because maybe that's what we really need to, to for the scavenger to really consume all the available nitrite and maybe that will kind of protect the API um, by itself. Um, but yeah, definitely you can't really yeah, ensure it's a very good homogeneity, really good distribution, or at least, yeah, how to really assess it could be like just some local fluctuations. Um, so, yeah, it's complex. Yeah, good question for the, uh, when you said you added a dry blend, but you eventually were granulated the That's whole right. blend, right? That's right? So did you by any chance compare that process with just dry blend and directly compressing? No, uh, actually, yeah, generation. we attempted to do this dry, uh, dry compression without going through the wet granulation, but uh, we did this with the second uh, drug. Okay. So this, with this drug that I presented today, we did only okay. wet granulation. That's right. That, that would be interesting to know. Yeah. 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 Speaking of, of, of antioxidant, I have a question. I was a bit confused, and this is an online question. I was interviewed by, okay, go ahead, Ray. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, thank you uh, for the great talks today. I appreciate uh, the knowledge that I've gained on the antioxidants uh, and also the, uh, the nitrites in these excipients. My question is more so about the excipients, so this is for Dr. Uh, Van Gessel, I appreciate it. Uh, so uh, in your, your talk, you showed uh, lactose and another excipient um, uh, against NDSR formation. And I wondered if uh, you, your model considered the fact that some antioxidant, some uh, NDSRIs form, uh, have higher probability of formation versus others uh, where potentially the, uh, the nitrite sources can be uh, completely um, uh, reacting and, and consumed. Um, and if that's some consideration that you had. Um, I also had a question related to um, the um, uh, processes that uh, are used to manufacture these excipients. And if there's some thought and considerations of actually using the scavengers within that process to perhaps uh, reduce uh, nitrite in the final, final uh, excipient product. And also, I'm not sure if there's any kind of considerations between nitrites and nitrates uh, as to one being more reactive than the other when it comes to the formation of NDSRIs. And a colleague of mine, uh, Matt Vera, had a question. Do you want me to seal your thunder? Or are you OK? <laughs> uh, he, he mentioned to me uh, on the, the margins here that we, we are having these conversations about nitrites in the formation of NDSRIs, but perhaps there are other uh, impurities in these um, 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 excipients that, that may also contribute to the formation of, uh, of NDSRs as well. They're not necessarily the, the nitrite source, um, you know, uh, front and center, but perhaps uh, some other uh, sources there. So thank you. Okay, quite some questions. Let's, uh, let's take it piece by piece. Um, so first of all, uh, the, the, um, the nitrate, the nitrites and the nitrates. Um, so uh, yeah, we're, we we initially were looking at both so nitrates and nitrites. But we uh, I think what, what what we generally see in literature is that uh, the nitrites dominate the, the the field going to NDSRIs. I wouldn't fully exclude it because you know case by case basis, but um, uh, definitely the major focus is with uh, nitrites. Um, going to the the question on the the conversion rate and the um, uh, the, the the potential that different APIs have a different reactivity towards uh, nitrization. Uh, very, we've, we've, we've heard already uh, very much so. 
the, the assumptions in the model. I have to go to my neighbor because a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of the assumptions came out of, uh, came out of his paper uh, where, we, uh, where we, we, we took basically two, uh, two different uh, levels or uh, from your paper. We took um, the, the secondary or tertiary amine and we took whether it was the base or the salt. And then we took that as as the, uh, the 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 base assumption across the model. So that is simplified. I, re I realize that, um, and and it could be that certain um, certain modalities are far more reactive than others. Uh, could very well be. Maybe you want to comment on that one. Yeah, sure. I'll, I think it's a great question, and I'm glad that it was raised. Uh, yeah, I mean it. it in, in the paper, we actually had a figure specifically trying to call this out. And it's obviously just with eight, eight different amines, but it, from that very limited work, it clearly showed that the extent of reactivity or what we saw at the end of our stability study, doesn't mean it's to infinity. We could have saw much more reactivity given enough time. But in that, in that window of study, we saw that, you know, the salt free base, different reactivity in the same formulation. And then if you change the formulation, you go from direct compression to wet granulation. Wet granulation in general showed higher level of extent of formation because of the water addition. I highlighted, and we saw that also in that trend that, you know, whether it's a, uh, maintained its crystallinity or not, you know, in that paper specifically, and we, this was to our surprise, in the same type of formulation, same type of process, one amine that had a, P, a PK of around four, so a very kind of highly reactive state, almost analytic, analenic in its, in its reactivity. When you look at public in the literature, highly reactive, very fast rates of formation versus one that had 10, around a PK of 10.2. We actually saw in the wet granulation for the higher PK, mean that we saw a higher extent of formation than the one with a PK around four. And that was a surprise to us. And after digging in, we found that the one with a lower, much lower PK, uh, robustly crystalline. I could not get it to, to change its crystallinity. And also is completely non-hygroscopic. In fact, through all my uh, career, I've never seen anything this uh, non-hygroscopic. It just wouldn't pick up moisture even at 90% RH. So it's the properties of these amines are very important and they're going to inform how much you could expend, expect to see in formation. And then if you plug it into Sanders model, you can then start to see the influence of the excipient or nitrite variation in, in coming up with an overall product model to help inform the risk assessment. But I think this is where it's, it's important that all the companies and, and researchers are, are putting this data into the literature. So hopefully we can get to the point of doing some machine learning type models where you could start <laughs> to inform, um, you know, for your given state without doing, you know, years of research to inform one product but taking the data that's out there to inform your development or specific risk assessment uh, using the abundance of data and some of these machine learning algorithms might be useful one day to help inform that specific case that you may have. And it's re really interesting because as well, um, going back to that, that, those two topics on specification, either on excipients or on the, um, the, the impurities, um, understanding, let's say, what kind of risk factors are out there and understanding what those risk factors, how they impact the NDSRI formation will allow us to be far more, well, I think a little bit more intelligent with the way that we approach it, uh, rather than that we put indeed a, 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 um, a generic uh, limit that is so excessively low uh, that it makes um, operations very, very difficult which kind of brings me also to the point of introducing scavengers into the manufacturing technology of excipients. Uh, we haven't fully ignored that perspective. Um, it does pose a, a, a significant challenge because uh, excipients versus excipients manufacturer versus drug manufacturer is also quite different. So uh, drug manufacturer typically, drug manufacturers produce a lot of drugs in small amounts, yeah. Whilst excipient manufacturers would typically uh, make a small amount of products, but a lot of them, right? So uh, the impact of a change in process 
So a single change might impact every one of you, right? And um, uh, that that make that makes that we have to do take a very careful uh, view on it, and also incorporating these kind of processes into given continuous processes are also not very easy. Um, and creating a sideline, especially for this, would mean essentially creating a completely new factory for potentially a niche problem. So um, uh, I'm not fully adverse to it, and we're definitely looking at it, but it's not it's not a quick fix uh, by any means. So uh, uh, who knows down the line? And there was a fourth one, but I forgot it. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe uh, uh, some other, uh, some of my other colleagues can help me there because uh, at the moment we're very focused on the on the nitrates and the nitrites. It maybe comment go ahead, go ahead. That. that's that's been a concern of mine and that speciation of you notice i always refer to it as the nitrosating species i tend not to say nitrite too much we have to remember we are measuring it as nitrite that's not necessarily what's in the excipient you can have organic nitrites which are you know covalently bound nitrites in fact one of the routes to ndsri synthesis is used tubule uh, nitrite um, and i can imagine very much in things like mcc Part of it being there present is that. Um, again, when we spike, we often pull the easiest thing off the shelf, sodium nitrite. Uh, do you think it's sodium nitrite that's present in uh, dibasic calcium phosphate? Probably not. Um, so we do really have to consider that. And whether we've got N2O3 surface adsorbed on a high surface area excipients. So it's a, it's a very good question. How is it speciated? I think there's going to be a take a lot of research to un even understand what that is, or you know, how, to, how to be able to do that. But anyway, that, that's a comment. Maybe I'll add one other thing, just for perspective. I hope we never become blasé about the fact that we're talking now about impurities or precursors, often at parts per billion levels. Like, this is a non-trivial situation. It would kind of be like saying, I'm gonna put a specification on this room right now that there can never be more than two live dust mites anywhere in this room at any given time. What kind of, you know, how are you gonna solve that one? <laughs> so, so Bing and then, and then Matt, okay, is that okay? Bing, go ahead. So, thank you. Yeah, this, this is very, very interesting. I, uh, I get very, very impressed. Especially, actually, this is really the first time I heard like a well, organic chemist talking about formulator. Right, so we really have to understand the mechanism behind this, uh, the formation of the nitrosamine uh, related impurity. So we talk about a lot, and I heard about a lot of people so wet granulation versus dry granulation. So now you have, as a formulator, you have to think about it, how this form. For. for me, it's still a puzzle. Why, for a direct compressions, you can still form in this kind of nitrosamine impurity? So we also have to think about this is from the process impurity or this is from shelf life as a degradations during the shelf life. Maybe the mechanism are different. Maybe they have different allowed to form in this kind of natural simulated impurity, you know. So we, it is, you know, then we have this modeling. We have to kind of predict. Then you have the hundreds of the branch, you know, to think about. So this is certainly very, very, uh, interesting. So I agree with a uh, previous, uh, someone mentioned, it's not simple solution. We don't think about a single, uh, uh, that's inhibitor or scavenger can solve the problem. It's, it's really a uh, multi-dimensions, uh, uh, things. And uh, this is very, uh, on top of that, it's very challenging. We're talking about a couple of dust, you know, in this room. So <laughs> congratulations, everyone. <laughs> So, Matt, you have a question? Yeah, I, I was just going to expand a little bit on, on Ray's last question about other impurities. We were sort of talking on the side about the, the pluses and minuses of this idea of specifications for nitrites in excipients and, and how you know, a single-minded focus on that is probably really the wrong way to go for lots of reasons. And I think Martin just mentioned some of them. but. What we were talking about were, you know, other other things besides the nitrate content per se of the excipient. I think, uh, you know, Martin mentioned the the solid distribution. Uh, you know, extrapolating that to nitrates and excipients, there there could be a lot of of various scenarios there. 
Um, the last talk, I think, by, by Roke talked about the introduction of, of NOx. So, so is that oxidizing something else that's in an excipient besides nitrite, right? And then there's, there's literature. I know Aloka mentioned kefir. I think there's literature going back to the 70s that showed that aldehydes can actually catalyze the nitrosation of an amine by nitrite. So you may have a tiny amount of nitrite coming from somewhere, but if that formulation has a catalytic amount of aldehyde, you know, the, the, the problem could be much more nuanced than just the nitrate content of the excipient. So it's really a very complicated product understanding uh, issue. I think that's pretty clear. So I think that's, that's what we were talking about in terms of the, the other impurities. So. I just wanted to say that you're so right. And uh, nitrate and nitrite are like the Corsican twins. Once, if one goes, the other follows. And the interconversion, especially, I used to work on physiological fluids, constantly happening, you know, though nitrate will always be higher. And as you said, there will be situations where, you know, there are other, not only in that specific excipient, it could be in another excipient in the formulation where you have a aldehyde or any other trigger that could control. So I always tell people, and you know, there are many who have told me, are you crazy? Nitrate does not nitrosate. I know that. I you know, worked on it for a long time, but you never know what what can cause or catalyze the conversion. So we should always look at the nitrogenous, like the oxides of nitrogen when in, in an excipient. And uh, as Martin said, it seems like unattainable. And Martin, I just wanted to thank you when you talked about that the means should be at Q3A right now. That was a Zantac moment when <laughs> they were talking. <laughs> Can't take Zantac anymore, but that's a different topic. Uh, yeah, we should not control impurities as precursors right now without understanding. I mean, we are going to already a lot of drugs are going out of market. You know, my aunt is already taking leaves of plants saying metformin gives her <laughs> cancer. I don't want that to happen to everybody. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to sort of end, and I'm, I think I'm going to, I sort of, I, you know, I think what Martin said is correct. You know, we're controlling these things at very, very tight, tight levels, parts per billion. It's like controlling a mind in this whole entire room. But, but I think this goes to the next section. So the next section we're going to, which will be session number two, which, you know, you know we're going to, you know, part of the reason this is happening is because we're controlling them at very, very conservative limits. But so hopefully in the next session, we can develop tools to develop, you know, to develop more clinically relevant specifications that, hopefully are not as conservative, we'll have to see, data will indicate that, and so we don't have to control all these inputs at such high, really stringent levels. So with that, and when we have one last question, then I'm going to end the session. Yes, I just wanted to make a comment on the standardized procedures for nitrite. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, at present, we are uh, developing methods for nitrates and nitrites in at-risk excipients. We are also analyzing several excipients, uh, you know, from different manufacturers, different batches, and generating data. And we will be uh, then um, discussing our uh, the data with our ex excipient expert committee members to uh, develop a strategy uh, for developing standards for nitrites in excipients. So there could be a stimuli article that would be published uh, maybe this year, and uh, we could come up with some uh, standard uh, uh, this year. Uh, but it will be uh, in the form of a stimuli article for seeking comments from all of our users and stakeholders. Yeah, that's the comment I had. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay thank you. So I think. No, I, I think I think I think you know we were supposed to end at at the twelve thirty. We already went ten minutes over. I think you know we should. I think I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any questions?
I'd like to thank all the speakers and panelists for such an engaging discussion. We had so many questions from online audience as well. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll break for lunch now. Uh, we will come back here at 1.30. Lunch will be just in the next room to my left. Uh, for the online audience, uh, we are going to shut down Zoom uh, just to figure out why our panelists are unable to turn on the video. So if there is an issue with the link when we change the settings, uh, please watch out for an email with a new link. Uh, please be sure to check your spam folders as well. I know a lot of people email us saying they didn't receive the link. A lot of times it ends up in your spam. Uh, see you all at 1.30. Thanks. Thank you.